Hello. Hello, Chelsea. <laughs> Sorry, we were really cutting it close with the last session. Uh, here we are for uh, for you now. People are joining as well. Um, thank you so much for being a speaker today. Oh, well, I'm happy to be with Guard. Thank you. We're really I'm on guard. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, anyone is welcome to be a member of Guard. It's really nice that we have people of all different uh, disciplines over here, undergraduate, graduate researchers, tenure faculty, uh, people in the medical profession, government, et cetera. So uh, this is a really exciting time for, for us, honestly. Uh, we will have a whole week of sessions today. Our short courses to help people prepare to uh, be comfortable talking about their science. Tomorrow is more like technical science courses. And then we have regional sessions throughout the week. Um, what's something that would be interesting for you particularly, um, since you've given talks on how to do an elevator pitch is that we have about 60 teams. A lot of them are MSU students where they came together to create elevator pitches for innovative technology. So that's nice. Innovation challenge, <laughs> innovative. And um, Saturday, anyone can join that one because it's a mock simulation. So you all be placed in groups if you go and then you work towards a certain topic that I'm not going to tell you about beforehand, but it'll be really fun. So uh, this is a great session to help people really understand how to get their research out there. Um, it will be recorded because people might already be asleep like in Asia, like <laughs> where it's the other side of the world, like 12 hour difference. So um, people may post in the Q&A on Whova for you later word, just if they see the video when they're awake. So um, thank you so much for joining us. I will just share my screen really quickly to show a quick video uh, from our sponsors, just to acknowledge all the wonderful people that helped make this. All right, thank you so much. Um, I will let Jill take it from here. Thanks, Chelsea. Hi, everyone. I'm happy to be here with you. Um, let me uh, explain a little bit about, uh, I, I, you may have read the uh, bio in Hoover. Um, I'll expand on it a little bit. Uh, I teach journalism here at Michigan State, and I've been here since 2008. I came here from the Detroit Free Press, uh, a, a big newspaper in Detroit, uh, while I was at the Free Press, I was the recruiter for a long time and an editor there for a total of about 25 years. And one of the important things that happens at any kind of medium, especially now, is paying attention to and seeing if we can incorporate and use and uh, disseminate some of the information people send us. So that's where my experience is. That's where I'm coming from when I talk to you about how to talk to editors. I <laughs> I was one. And some people say, well, you still think you're one. That's why you teach your classes the way you do. So I'm going to jump into a slideshow here. Um, the good news is you'll be seeing it instead of me. And okay, let's see. 
I want to, I think I want to go into slideshow mode. I guess I am in slideshow mode. It's showing the slides down the side. That's okay. Whatever you see is what you see. I think you can um, press play from the start on the top left and it'll make it full screen for you. If I... Yeah, right under there. Trust me. Yep. Yeah, oh. Sure. Awesome. Chelsea, you're, you're a genius. Yep. <laughs> so... How do we get editors to do what they don't know they want to do, which is to publish your stories? Um, the heading is a good one. Um, all, all the parts of it, getting editors to do something is not always easy. Editors means editors, producers, anyone who's in a gatekeeper position at a publication. Publication can be print or online or video. And we will talk about stories. So that's what we're here for. The title in this case was not misleading. So what we're really talking about when we talk about the background that some of you guys have is turning concepts into content. Editors see everything as content. Um, uh, inventors, makers, and people of that sort are often thinking about uh, ideas, concepts, how can we make something better? How can we make something happen? So it's not really content in the sense that editors see content. So you're trying to, uh, I'll use this word again, translate concepts into something that they can use to reach readers. Um, uh, Chelsea, question for you. If a person has a question live in the middle of this, can they chat it out or speak it out? How will they get yeah, their they can either. Out. Okay, good. Um, thank you. So I, I do like to be interrupted. Um, rude interruptions are appreciated as well as polite ones. Um, so what we're really talking about is taking your ideas, uh, maybe the thing you're making, maybe the thing you've made, and turning it into um, a content for an editor. What we're trying to do is use, think about it this way, um, there's a publication in Michigan called Bridge Magazine. Bridge Magazine actually does not have a magazine. Um, it has a website. It doesn't have a magazine. They produce a lot of content, and their whole idea is to get their content onto the railroad tracks that are laid by other organizations, such as newspapers and websites and, and, and TV stations. So what we're trying to do is hop on somebody else's railroad tracks to get ideas into circulation and to get support for our ideas. Why do we need our ideas to be supported? I think you came because you know. We want people to support our research. We want people to get behind us and understand what we're doing and value what we're doing. We want people to tell the officials who run our states, counties, countries to support what we're doing. Sometimes we need a little funding and Having people understand what we're doing is key to having that funding come through. I find that to get funding, you have to have a good story. You have to make people understand why this is urgent. And you have to be in the same space as the funder or the audience. So that's what we're, that's what we're doing. Turning concepts, turning ideas into this content that people will uh, ingest is very difficult. I'm not going to lie. It's very difficult. You have basically 26 letters, the same letters that I have, if you're writing in English, more or less if you're in another language. And you have to take these very crude instruments, these letters with a few pieces of punctuation, and you have to turn them into a series. You have to line them up correctly so that the idea in my head gets into your head. That's not easy. How can I convey? an idea uh, with just these letters? How can I write an effective love letter? How can I write a threatening note? How can I ask the bank to please, please listen to me? I'm trying to talk to you. How can I do this with these 26 letters? It is difficult. I'm not going to lie. Um, we are trying to make concepts, which tend to be abstract, into something concrete, content that people can relate to when we're very successful, when we're very successful uh, with our content creation, we can touch people emotionally. 
when we touch them emotionally and they say, ah, I get it. I see why this is important. I see why this matters. I want one or I need one. When that happens, you have mastered the 26 letters. So how do we get there? The first thing to do is study the market of your messenger. I should probably say study your messenger's market. Who are they trying to reach? Because remember, you're going through a middle person. You're going through a producer. You're going through a news director to try to reach part of their audience that you want for your concept. So you really have to know who they are. Think about this. Even with journalism students who should be thinking about uh, audience all the time, they don't think about the audience. They think about, oh, maybe their editor. They think about themselves. That Maybe they're not thinking about anything in particular. They're just putting words together. Think about who you're writing to. When I write, uh, I'll show you a project that I work on uh, pretty soon. When I write for that project, I am writing for a representative member of that audience. And very often it is my mom. <laughs> yes, I have to think about who is this for? So I try to think about the people who need my concept, who need my product. And I try to write directly to them. If you're going after a connection to somebody's marketplace, somebody's audience, you probably don't want everybody in that audience. You probably just want some of them. So think about the people you want most and direct your talk, your content, your video, whatever you're making, direct it toward those people. Before I got on here, I thought a little bit about who you are. I'm trying to think of who is my audience right now? Who are you? If I'm not connecting with you, if I'm not reaching you, if you're clicking off, I apologize. I must have done my crude market analysis in a slobby fashion. So. We need to know who we're trying to reach all the way through and the other end. We're talking about audience. Um, da, 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 da. Uh, when you're studying your messenger's market, you might also want to know who are their competitors. Yes, who are their competitors? Um, who do they compete with? What makes them their particular niche in the marketplace? Um, you want to take the editor's product and dissect it. How big? How long? Where and when do people absorb it? Are they likely to read it at work, at home, leaning forward toward a laptop, or leaning back with a tablet? Where are they probably going to be seeing your stuff? This should affect how you make your message get all the way through that. The other thing you want to do is you want to take the publication apart and see what its parts are. Uh, do they have little features? Do they have long features? Do they have reviews? Do they have a significant amount of their content on social media, which might not be in the newspaper or magazine itself? So you really want to do a study of that place. It's going to be worth it. You'll see in a minute why it's going to be worth it to put all that work into publishing one time. I'll, I'll tell you later. Don't go away. <laughs> so Here's what I wanted to tell you about. This is one of my passion projects at Michigan State. Uh, this is from a series. Oh, look, here's one now. I have one right here. Does this look familiar? <laughs> this is the Bias Buster series or from the Bias Buster series. Right now, it's about 20 books with about five more on the way. These are designed to reach people who have a good heart, a good soul. They want to know more about other people and they're willing to spend a little bit of time reading about them. Why do they want to know? This is where I think about my mom. My mom loves everybody, and she lives in a, uh, an apartment complex. So everybody comes there, and she's curious about all of them, wants to talk to them, but doesn't want to hurt their feelings. She also doesn't want to seem like a dummy. So she appreciates getting a little bit of an introduction to the communities that might come through her apartment complex. So we're trying to answer her basic questions, 100 basic questions about whatever group we're talking about. So to do these guides, I have to tell my students who their audience is. Their audience is not people who have closed minds. They will not look at a book like this. So good. So I can forget about those people. Fortunately, there's very few of them, right? <laughs> my audience is open-minded people who are curious about other people 
who maybe have no baseline information. So any question is appreciated. Nothing is too basic. And they're going to try to absorb this so they can go out and have conversations with the people. So that's the audience for this series. Anybody who wants to work on this series has to understand that. Um, we also pay attention because we're a news program. We pay attention to what are contemporary issues. Uh, for example, this semester right now, we're doing a guide about Hmong Americans. Hmong Americans came to the United States as the U.S. pulled out of Southeast Asia. They mostly came from Laos, some from Thailand. Uh, ethnically, they started off in China and then moved south down the, the, the peninsula. They came here starting in 1975. This is 2023. We're coming up to their 50th anniversary. The interest in Hmong people is going to uh, hit a little peak in about two years when our book will be out with people and when people will be talking about who are the Hmong people. They mostly live in just a few cities. So our greatest audiences will be in places like Fresno, the Twin Cities, the Lansing area, what do you know, uh, North Carolina. So that's our audience. Um, when we write these guides and when you write for or submit to a publication, we have certain uh, style, certain kind of style. Our style goes like this. We are trying to be accessible. If you read our guide, you'll notice the sentences are short. They're clear. They're concise. Their average length is 16 words. This is all on purpose. We don't think anybody in our audience is dumb. We think they're smart. We think they have open minds. We think they want to know and understand. And we know from research that the 16 word sentence is the best for comprehension. So we will not be throwing around any 45 word sentences like maybe some of my professor friends do. We are not doing that because that is not right for our audience. Uh, so anybody who works on our guide has to be getting used to the idea that they can get their ideas down to very concise sentences. It is not easy, but that's part of our style. So that's one publication or a series of publications. Those are some style elements you need to be aware of. If you're, um, I'll tell you a little story. This is kind of funny. Uh, I think uh, a, a person at a radio station was complaining to me because public relations people were sending her pictures with their press releases. She said, don't they get it? We're a radio station. We don't use pictures on the radio. Well, <laughs> fast forward to today, most radio stations need the pictures. They have websites. So that PR person was ahead of their time. So uh, I said we would get to this. Let's jump to it right now. Where's the story? I thought about calling this, where's your story? Um, an article, a piece of content has to be more than just a bunch of blah, blah strung together. It has to engage people and stories are very engaging. I just told you a little story about a public relations person and a radio station. I bet you'll remember that because it's a story. We remember stories. When you're talking about getting your concept into somebody else's content, think about the stories. If you're immersed in the story, you might not even know it's there. You might not even see it. You might say, well, that's just me. I just go to work. I do my thing and, and stuff happens. That's not the story. What is your story? What is the story of your idea? What is it born from? Did it come from a mistake? Did it come from a personal need? Oh, my father really needed this. And so I did the research and I found it. Did it come from a brilliant discovery? And what led to that brilliance? Was it the result of a, a flash in the pan, a eureka moment? Or was it sparked by something you read or a conversation in the hallway? Was it uh, an unsolved mystery for a long time? When you think about your concept, your project, your thing, try to think about how Hollywood tr would treat that story. What if Hollywood were to make an idea, a movie about your idea or your project? 
what would be the opening scene? What would be the chapters in that story? What would drive people through the story? Look for those story elements. I don't want, if I'm an editor and I asked you for 500 words, I don't want 5,000 because you're telling me a really good story. I don't have room for 5,000. I have room for 500. I want you to stick to that. But you can put story elements into even a short story. So if you want to engage me, if you want me to sit up and pay attention, if you want me to listen, if you want me to remember, tell me a story. When you think about stories, it can take you all the way back to your mother or father's lap and the stories you heard them reading to you from a book or that they made up themselves or that came from the family. And you remember those stories still. Do not forget the power of story and try to put it to work for you as you try to get editors to publish your stuff. So what would Hollywood do with your story? Why don't you beat them to it? Ah, there she is. There she is. My editor. And she is coming up with a big headache. You, if you want to get editors to publish your story, you need to know what they need and then answer those needs. This editor looks like somebody who's a little disappointed and a little bit quizzical. She's kind of wondering, uh, what is it you don't understand about what I told you? Doesn't she have that kind of look? I thought she did. Know what the editor needs and then answer them. Don't get me wrong. Don't, don't mistake this. Your audience is her audience. You're trying to write all the way with or through or in hands with her to her audience. But she's your number one, your first gatekeeper. I won't even call her an audience. She's a gatekeeper. If she doesn't like it, it ain't going nowhere. So she's got to like it. She's got to like it. If she's paying attention to her audience, then she knows what they want. If you're paying attention to her audience, then you know it too. The closer your ideas about audience are to the editors, the easier this is going to be. So know what your editor needs. What might an editor need? Oh, it could be big things. I need to see real people in your content. I need to hear from the developers, uh, the people who use this product, the people who can benefit from this miracle drug. I need to see real people in there. That could be a need. Another need could be, I have a very technical audience. They're going to want to know a lot about exactly how you did this, as much as you can tell them. I'm going to need to see some formulas. I'm going to need to see the accurate scientific names for things. That could be a need. Um, another editor might say, I told you I need pictures. There's no picture here. <laughs> I need pictures. Where are the pictures? Did you not listen to me? Well, I don't have any pictures. Well, certainly I don't have any. If you don't have any pictures and I'm not going to get them, you don't have a place for your story in my publication. So know what that editor needs and deliver it. Um, they might need particular topics. They might need, uh, sometimes they'll use language that you have to tease out of them. They say, I need a softer lead on this. You say, oh my God, what is that? Have them explain softer and have them explain lead. Lead is the top of a story in a printed publication. It can be, depending on the editor, one sentence, two sentences, two paragraphs, the first four paragraphs. Find out what they mean when they talk about it. Do they have pet topics? We would take as many stories as we could get about toothpaste. Our readers love toothpaste articles. If you can bring me something that makes toothpaste better or that has toothpaste in it, you got a sale. We'll use it. Um, some editors, oh, this is a terrible. Here's another little story. I talked to a reporter who was quitting my newspaper, the Free Press, and I said, why are you leaving? She said, my editor drives me crazy. I come back from doing my interviewing, and he always asks me the same three questions. Question number one was, how long is it? Question number two was, 
Does it have a picture? <laughs> question number question three was, uh, the question number three was, um, when can I have it? Okay, so the editor was com communicating her needs to a reporter. I needed it at a certain length. I needs to have a picture and I need it by a certain time. But the editor was not good at communicating. <laughs> that happens a lot, by the way. Um, if I'm the editor, I already know when you're going to have your story to me because I'm going to tell you. That's one of my needs. I will know whether there's a picture because I know who you're talking to because I asked you. And length doesn't matter. If your story is too long, I can fix that, right? Yes, I can. I can make it shorter. If I want 15 column inches and you give me 30, or if I want a one-minute video and you give me three minutes, I know how to make that happen. If you're too short, it's a little harder, but I still know how to pad things out. So find out what the editor needs. How long? Feature? Hard news? Quotes from people? Pictures? What do you need? And then it's your job to go get them. Okay, next. Where are we going next? Huh. Oh, maybe there's a, I'm trying to advance the slide. It's giving me a different tool. There we go. Okay. Don't those look awful? <laughs> That's not my idea of what you should do to a donut, but some people might consider those to be goodies. I always give up some extras that I think the editor will want. When I write a story, and I'm usually doing this uh, for money or as a favor. When I'm writing a story, I will supply some artwork. Even if the editor doesn't ask for it. Why? Because I want to distinguish myself from other people who are also offering up stories. I want to be the best. So I'm going to give them artwork that they can use. And I'm going to um, try to help them display my story better. I'm usually writing for print media and or a website. Have you ever, well, you've seen the research, you've heard the research. When you send out a Facebook post or a tweet with no picture, what happens to it? It gets buried. It gets buried. Uh, the algorithms on those websites bury things that don't have pictures. And readers don't pay that much attention to them. Maybe you've tried the experiment where you send out a tweet without any art. Then you send it out again with art. You get way more hits on the one that has a picture. So I'm thinking about this saying, well, what kind of picture can I offer my editor? And now here's what might happen. The editor might say, oh, good. He thought of sending us a picture. We can use this. Well, great. If I do that two or three times, I'll say, ask Joe, you'll get a picture. We don't even talk to him. He just always sends a picture. Uh, the other thing that will happen is your content will get more traction. More people will see it because of the artwork. Now, that has a, an effect. If you as a content contributor are frequently or consistently getting more hits, they're going to want to run you more often. So always give those extra goodies. There's a purpose for them. Uh, in my case, it's going to be pictures. Uh, you might want to send audio clips. I just looked at something today by a, um, a poet who I'm asking to write something for our next Bias Busters guide. And some of her poets are posted, on, her poetry is posted online and she reads it. One of the issues we're going to deal with in the Hmong guide is pronunciation. Hmong is a tonal language and that's hard to explain. But when you hear her reading her poem and including some Hmong words and even showing how they're different from each other, although they might be spelled the same, I loved it. The audio makes me want to have that poet in our book. We've never had a poet in there before. I hope she says yes. If she says yes and wants a little bit of money, I'm going to scrounge around. I'll probably find a little money for the poet. Oh. Deadlines, people. Let me tell you something. This is the original meaning of deadlines. The word was invented during 
the war between the North and the South in the United States, the Civil War, what the South likes to call the War of Northern Aggression. <laughs> oh, boy. Let's not get that whole thing started. There were, I think both sides did this. They had so many prisoners taken from the other side that they didn't have a stockade or a barracks or any place to house them. So they would chalk a line on the ground. They would use chalk and make a line on the ground and say, you stay inside that box. If you come out, we will kill you. We don't need a stockade. We have men with guns here. If you come outside, that's it. That line is the deadline. That's how serious the original deadline was. If you crossed the line or didn't obey the line, somebody would shoot you. That doesn't happen anymore. But, uh, embarrassing to say, I don't know if these two things are related. I had a nice, easy gig writing pieces for a newspaper that was doing a high school publication. I was late with a couple of them, and all of a sudden, I didn't have any more jobs to do with them. <laughs> Coincidence? I'm afraid to ask. Meet your deadlines, or you will be dead to those editors. This is a time-sensitive business. If they say three o'clock on Monday, that's the last possible minute. You can turn it in on Sunday. You can turn it in two hours early. You cannot turn it in at 3.01. So plan to be on time. That's how you make deadlines. You plan to be on time. Here's a process I follow. When I get an assignment, I'm usually excited and full of ideas. I write them down. This is inspiration. It's going to take perspiration to turn that into a well-crafted piece of content. But I try to get the ideas that got me excited down while I have them and then come back to it a little bit after it has some time to germinate. But a few days or if it's a tight deadline, hours before it's due, I know I can get it done because the deadline gives me that pressure to finish it up. But I don't want to lose that inspiration moment. So I put that down. I come back later. And I know the deadline is going to pressure me. I hate to miss a deadline. Another thing you should know. You know this already, maybe not in these terms. Inanimate objects are out to screw you, right? Your camera is going to run out of batteries. You'll leave your laptop where it doesn't want to be. You will, your pencil will break. <laughs> Inanimate objects are out to uh, torment you, make you miss deadlines. So you have to leave a little bit of time in there to get your story done early so that it can be turned in on time because something is bound to go wrong. And I'm sorry, I'm your editor, not your mother. I do not want you to say, oh, Joe, I'm sorry, my story would have been in on time, but, but my car broke down. Your car's mechanical system is not my problem. I don't want to hear about your car. I want my story. You might tell me later, Oh, yeah, that story was almost late. My car broke down, but I did this and I did that and I Ubered and I got the story. You can tell me that later, but I do not want you to make your problem be my problem. I don't have time for this. Um, okay. Be accessible. Be accessible. Chelsea, if you don't mind, I'm going to pick on you. Are you okay? <laughs> You've been sending me lots of emails. And they had some different uh, Zoom addresses in them. I wasn't sure that I had the right Zoom address. So I said, oh, geez, it's time. It's time. I don't want to be late. I better check with Chelsea. So I checked your email. Um, I kind of wanted to call you because I have one of these right here, right? Uh, but I couldn't call you. I don't have your phone number. Uh, I thought, oh, geez, how am I going to reach Chelsea? I think she's in one of these sessions someplace. She might have her devices nearby. or turn I don't know what's going on. So I sent you an email through University Mail. And Chelsea was accessible. Yay! She responded to me, even though she was tied up in another session. She said, yes, Joe, you have the proper Zoom link. So, oh, thank you. Thank you for being accessible, Chelsea. Um, after, you, after you turn in your article, do not go on a vacation to 
the far northern Canada where there is no cell reception. Okay, don't do that. Um, stay home. Make sure, well, sometimes things go to the wrong place. Sometimes they say, oh, we love that story. We'd like to, we'd like to make it longer. Can you get me some pictures? What does this mean? I have questions. Be available to your editors. Um, in fact, a really nice thing is to call them. Here's a phone call. I hate. I hate it when somebody says, students do this a lot. If you're a student, I apologize because none of you ever did this to me. Students will say, did you get my email? Well, yesterday I got 200 emails. Uh, the correct answer is probably, yes, I got your email. No, I have not read it. Um, here's the way to do that. Say, yesterday I emailed you and asked if I could have um, more space for my story. Oh, well, what's your story about? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, sure. So don't ask, did you get the email? That's a yes or no closed-ended question. It won't take us very far. But it's very good to call the editor and don't say, did you get my story? Don't do that. That requires the editor to stop everything and go look to see if the story is in. Instead, say, I sent you my story. I'm going to be at this number, and I'm going to keep my phone with me and charged up for the next couple of days. If you have any questions, just give me a call. So do that to your editor. That's being very accessible. You're saying, the story's in. I'm ready for questions. Can you do that? That would be a lot better than saying, did you get the story? <laughs> Please don't do that. <laughs> Drives me nuts. Maybe I'm the only one. Or maybe you're one of them too. Okay. Does this look like you after they've edited your story? Ah, uh, it's happened to me so many times. I don't even get this way anymore. I was interviewed on the radio two weeks ago, three weeks ago for a book I did about Coney Island hot dogs. I was interviewed by WDET radio in Detroit. And uh, my co-author, the she I she's the lead author. The two of us were interviewed and they put out the story. And so the two book authors got together on the phone. She's in Boston. I'm in Michigan. What did you think of the story? Well, this, that, and the other thing. We weren't 100% satisfied. But here's what we, so we did. We could have made this face, but we didn't. We said, well, what did it take? It took us a few minutes. We were on the radio. He talked about our book. He didn't mention the name of the book. That's one of the things that really bugged us. But what the heck? You know, we're lucky that he even called us. So when you get edited, be kind of philosophical about it. Don't take it personally. Believe it or not, the editing relationship is not an adversarial relationship. The editor is not your enemy. The editor is supposed to be your friend, right? You have the same goal to reach audience. So as edits happen, if you have a chance to get in front of them, and check your copy before it gets put out or check your video before it gets posted. Say, oh, hey, here's a thing we forgot to include. We forgot to include. They know what you're saying. So be graceful about the editing. Nobody is there trying to screw you. They're trying to do probably 300 things at the same time. And maybe they did a poor job on yours. Or maybe they didn't understand you. When people don't understand something I write, I assume that's a Joe problem. Often it isn't, but I think a better place, a safer place to begin from is, oh, I must have done something wrong there. Let's try to fix it. So make it pleasant to be edited by this person, uh, pleasant for both of you, rather than a big fight, okay? Fighting never gets us anywhere. And remember, you really are on the same side. You want to do the same thing. You want to get this article into print the best way it can be. And when you're writing a book, if they want to change the title that you love, listen to them. Every time I've done a book, somebody has changed the title and they always made it better. Their goal is to sell books. My goal is to sell books. If they have a title that they think will sell better than what I had in mind, I'm going to listen. Okay, follow up with people, follow up with people. 
after you're through the editing stage, after it's been out there, after the audience has seen it, um, do two things. The first thing is, and this is hard. Okay, you've handed them your baby. Here's my baby. And they painted a mustache on the baby. You don't want to see this. I do not want to see any mustaches on my baby. Therefore, I am not going to look at the baby after this is all done. Look at the baby. Read the story all the way to the end. It will be hard because you've probably written it, edited it, re-edited it. You've read it so many times you're sick of it. And now I'm asking you to read it again. Read it again. If your editor has made changes in it, they're telling you something without telling you. Oh, I notice my editor uses the Oxford comma. I'm from journalism, the planet journalism. We do not use the Oxford comma. We call it the serial comma. If my editor wants Oxford commas, I am going to use Oxford commas. Just makes sense, right? So you got to read what they did to your story. Learn from them. Oh, they call everybody Mr., Ms., or Dr. I don't do that. I just use the last name. Well, I better get on board with their system. Oh, they totally screwed up what this paragraph was about. Mm, 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 mm. That's a problem because now I might have to deliver some bad news to the editor. At least I know um, where they might have a deficit, and that will help me. Uh, as we go forward, uh, we'll talk about going forward real soon, I promise. So have these conversations after the story gets published. They can be about nice things. How did that story do? Oh, it didn't do very well. Not many people clicked on it. Oh, what should we do differently? What should we do differently? Well, I think maybe it was a bad headline over here. I think we tried to make a joke in the headline, and that doesn't really work when people are getting all their news through Googling. We need to be more literal in what our headline says. Oh, okay. Would it help if I suggested a headline on the next one? Well, yeah, why don't you give us an idea? Okay. That's a good conversation that comes out of follow-up. You are not done with your story when you turn it in. No, no, no. Somebody might call you. You might call them. And then after the edits happen, see what you can learn. The other good thing you can do in that conversation is, hey, do we have another slide here? Oh, maybe I can hack the system. Hacking the system means this. Editors don't need everything in equal amounts. Some things are more necessary than others. You want to find what they really need. If they have a feature, uh, that never has enough stuff for it. You shouldn't find that out and try to feed them stuff for that feature. Could be like chunky bits in the back of the magazine, maybe on the back cover where people, everybody's going to see them. Could be what they really need are more charts, not the kind of charts we generate out of Excel, but nice charts. Do you know somebody who can make a nice chart? Send them charts. Uh, here's one way when I hacked the system by accident. We had done a Bias Busters guide on veterans, 100 questions and answers about veterans. And it happened to come out one summer. And an editor at the Associated Press, a big news organization, got a hold of our press release and our guide and said, oh, this looks pretty good. I'll do something about this for upcoming um, uh, Veterans Day. No, it was Memorial Day. They did it for, okay, here's the difference. Memorial Day are for service people who have, who have died. Veterans Day is for all veterans, living or dead. So it was Memorial Day, a federal holiday. People at that newsroom get that day off. So the editor said, ah, we need to have some Memorial Day features. And I am shorthanded. This is where the system gets hacked. I don't have reporters here, um, but I found this press release. This will be a story. It's timely, so it meet, ma matches up with Memorial Day, and it's easy to do because it's a good press release right here. So the editor put out the press release about our book 
for the Memorial Day weekend. More than 100 newspapers picked that up. So we got lots of orders. If you can give people content at a time when they really need com content or for a place where they really need it, if you understand them that well, you're really going to make yourself um, valuable to them and you're going to have an advantage. So understand the system and then hack it. Find its weaknesses or its needs and take advantage of them by providing them with just the solution they want at just the right time. And finally, let's make another deal. You've done a lot of work now. You've met the editor. You've called her. You've uh, discussed how to say certain things. You've asked her what her needs are. She's published one of your stories. She knows you by name. She has your phone number. She can text you. You've done all this work. Don't stop now. Do the next story. Make another deal. It is 10 times easier to go back to an editor who likes you than to warm up one who's never met you before. So all that work you're doing is not for the first story only. It's for the second and the third and the fourth. You might ideally get to a place where an editor says, hey, give me a story about, you know, hummingbirds. Um, and I want some recordings. And you'll know exactly what they mean. And you've got it. So I'm going to turn off the share. Say, say goodbye to the shuffling hands there. I'm here. You're here. Um, that's what I have for prepared remarks. I'm available to answer questions. And then in about 15 minutes, no later than, I'm going to go to class. <laughs> I have to go talk to my journalism students. Any questions? You can chat them or you can voice them. Hi, Joe. I just want to express our gratitude to you. Thank you so much on behalf of Guard. Thank we want you. To express our gratitude to you. I know you're very busy, and thank you for your time. Oh, that's very kind of you. I'm not any busier than you. Sure. <laughs> but thank you. Appreciate it. And you're you welcome. did a great presentation. Thank you. Chelsea told me what to do. <laughs> She's good at it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it's just funny because like I tell people what to do. <laughs> but um, I actually wanted to share the results from this poll that you had before. So okay. this was the one viewer, actually everyone should have been able to answer this poll where you give us a word about your goal for being published. I don't know if you want to say anything about this, Joe. Yeah, I I I like. The orange one that says gain knowledge, um, that might seem like, huh? But I get it. I learn so much when I write about something that it, uh, uh, creating content can be a very useful learning tool. Credentials, I certainly understand. Here's one thing I learned about credentials. I heard, here's another little story. I heard a woman talking on the radio. She sounded very authoritative. I wondered how she knew so much. So when I got out of my car, I got on LinkedIn, I looked her up. She had basically no background in her field. She had been a hypnotherapist in something completely different from what she was talking about. But she had written a book. So then it dawned on me, you don't become an expert so that you can write a book. Writing books makes you an expert to the uninformed. <laughs> so yes. Having an article out there is a credential. Take advantage of it. Disseminate, communicate, leadership. Yes, if you're a leader, if you're so crazy and in love with the thing you're doing, people expect you to take a leadership role. And that can include writing to the field, writing to the, your colleagues. Um, contribute, lovely. Connecting, wonderful. These are good words, people. I, I, I see the word no. That must be from an editor. <laughs> <laughs> no. So um, I actually have some questions in the Q&A for you. They are in Hoopa, so I'm just going to read them to you. One okay. is, how do you edit and revise your work? So what are some maybe tips that you have for that? For your own work? 
How do you yeah, edit so you guys your own work? Something and you provide some details. How should I go upon editing and revising it? Okay. I have to go get this. You know what this is? Remember What's what that? I said about inanimate objects? I'm gonna plug this one into the side of this laptop. Um uh, your first draft is never gonna be very good. Sleep on it. Go back, look at it the next day, tear it up, put it together a new way, and do that again. I find, maybe you do this, I find that very often while I'm sleeping, my brain keeps working. Sometimes I can't get it to work during the day, but it works at night, and it will take my story and send me little messages about what I should do to the story. So I get up, or I, I might get up in the middle of the night and write things down on a piece of paper, or I can tell them to my phone. And then when I get up, I say, oh, yes, that what was that idea? Oh, yes, here it is. So let your subconscious help you do some editing. Um, another tip, I tell this to all my journalism students, before you turn in your story, read it out loud. I'm serious. Read it out loud. Things that are not right might not appear to, uh, appear to you until you voice them and hear yourself voicing them and say, wow, that was a terrible sentence or that doesn't make sense, or that's just flat out wrong. Um, awesome, I have some more questions for you, thanks. So um, yeah. some people are curious, how do you get an editor or attract a publisher? So how do you go upon figuring out an outlet essentially? Well, uh, this is part of the reason why it's good to, once you have an editor, keep, working with them because they're hard to find um one one thing to look at it go to the reference desk at a library and look up a book called writer's market writer's market mostly lists magazines and it will tell you which ones accept freelance articles and whether they pay that's a good place to look um it helps if you can identify a place that has in its audience the people you want to reach with your concept you might say, hey, your magazine goes to a lot of fly fishermen. I have just done an interview with the world's oldest fly fisherman. I think, and, and it's a woman, it's a fly fisher woman. I think your audience would like this article. And I have an interview with her. She's very old. She's 108 years old. So I think we ought to hurry up and do this. Um, so you can uh, attract editors with a good story, which might be better than your credentials. You say, I am a I am a nuclear physicist and I study isotopes all the time, all day long. That's all I study. I'd like to write an article for you. Well, so far I'm not interested. <laughs> I want to know not about you. I want to know about the article. That's what I want to know. So who you are doesn't matter as much as what you can do. Um, so lead with that. Yeah, thanks. There's okay. another one. So I, I see are, a question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Handling two chats at once. Uh, I know you can read that one, but I'll read it for everyone just to make sure in case some people um, can't access the chat. So uh, they said, uh, Adrian said that thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. The tips are really helpful. I guess the most difficult to part for me would be uh, being concise since most of the time, it seems that everything is important. That is why I need to include them in writing. Do you have any tips on how to effectively uh, to be yes. effectively concise? Adrian, I don't doubt what you're saying for a minute. I believe it's all important. But I also believe that if I saw it, I could cut words out of it without taking out any ideas, without taking out any of your wonderful, beautiful ideas. I think we can make it tighter. It'll move fast. And look, look how people are nowadays. They don't want to watch a four-minute video of a cat. If I can get that done in 40 seconds, I'm on to the next cat. It's the same with writing. Being concise means taking out words that don't really do anything to carry your idea forward. I would look after wordy expressions. I would go after the modifiers. A lot of times you don't need those modifiers, those adverbs and adjectives. They just add extra bulk to your story. You think they make your writing more colorful, but usually they don't. And the other thing that I would do is I would make sure you're not repeating any important information. 
if it's important, say it once and just once. So I would do those things. Look for redundancies in your sentences and paragraphs. A classic one that I see, and I don't think a researcher would do this, but a journalism student might. Um, the mayor said she was really happy. Next paragraph says, I'm really happy, said the mayor. Well, that's redundant. That's where you can be more concise. Let the mayor say it or you say it, but don't both of you say it. Uh, any word that's not doing a job in there, I want to get rid of. Um, um, I hate it when somebody writes in order to. Usually they just mean to. So I cut out in order. I hate it when people say, I don't know whether or not to have lunch. No, I don't know whether to have lunch. We don't need or not. There's lots of those little words lurking in there that you can cut out. Be the knife, Adrian. Yeah, that makes sense. There, um, some people like to say that it's adding extra fluff to your um, to your writing. Yeah, I, th I think with the adjectives, yeah, it's mm -hmm. fluffy, fluffy writing. Yeah, ironically, fluff is fluffy. <laughs> so, one last question for you. Unless anyone okay. throws a quick one in the chat, I have one more from Hoobam. What are some key concerns that editors may have in order to select your story before publishing it? If it's professionally done and really clean looking. It goes to the top of the stack. Um, uh, concept is important. Your concept is what it is. But if you handle the mechanics well, then you'll be respected better by the editor. They'll say, oh, th this looks like it'll be a pleasure to edit. Yeah, I agree. Whenever something looks clean and organized, I'm much more yeah. looking at it, right? Uh, we so don't want to they, confuse the editors. Oh. Of course. Uh, so thank you so much, Joe. And thank you, everyone, for asking these uh, very um, important questions. Uh, Joe, I really do always enjoy learning from you. I uh, can't wait to hear from you again in the future. I'm going to, I'm going to, I have something, questions? I have something oh. here for you. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Yes, and if you all uh, follow uh, Global uh, Guard on Twitter or social media, we have uh, tagged Joe as well. And if you have any questions for him, you can still write your questions on the Hoovum, and he can respond to it, or I can send them to him, and you can even message him through Hoover. So um, thank you so much. Hey, Joe, I have a question for you. Oh, yes. Can we invite you to be part of Guard and help us the, help the whole world? with your expertise? Oh my gosh. Well, I'm flattered that you might invite me, but I don't know what I would say. Let just what spot. you just said. <laughs> just what you just said to us. So, so many people, we we'll, we'll learn a lot. We we'll learn a lot. Oh, thank you. You're, you're very nice, Evangeline. Yeah. So would you like to be part of Yehovah, our guard? Uh, I'm sorry, I can't hear you anymore. We, we there must be like something wrong you. with my connection. <laughs> I will put the chat on the chat. Yeah, well, so I'm, gonna go, that... I'm gonna go teach my class now. <laughs> okay, so Chelsea okay. will connect with you. Okay. Thanks, bye -bye. Joe. Take care, bye.